Amen. Well, good morning. How are you? Hey, good, good morning. Hey, if you're new or you're watching online, really glad you are here. And uh, my name's Eddie. I have the honor and privilege of serving as one of the pastors. And we are in a new series that's not really a new series because really our series started on Friday night, as Pat mentioned. We had a revival for Friday night and Saturday night at our Union Cross campus, and Pastor Josh did a great job. The worship was incredible. It was a real sweet spirit in the room. And so this morning, we're we're kind of going off of that momentum, and and for, for those who couldn't make it, We're in a series called Encounter. And in this series, we're looking at how can we encounter God in our daily lives. We all want to encounter God daily. Amen? Amen? You see, our lives are made up of moments, made up of encounters. They could be big moments like a child being born, a loved one passing away, or a job offer. It could be small moments like the quiet, still mornings when all you hear is the coffee brewing. For people with young kids, you don't know what that sounds like. Um, I don't know what that sounds like a lot of times. The small moments of traveling to a destination or, the, or those simple moments where you see your kids or grandkids smile. You see, these moments are where we encounter an emotion, a feeling, an action, or a thought. And let's be honest, we have a lot of moments or a lot of encounters that catch us off guard, right? I was thinking of one of these moments, one of these encounters that caught me off guard. Uh, My wife and I, uh, back uh, late last summer... We were on a date night, and we were going, uh, we were in downtown Winston, and remember, we haven't lived here that long, so it's not like we have a big pool of people that we know or a big network. No, we kind of just moved here not knowing anyone, and we're kind of meeting people along the way, and so we're on this date night, and it's just my wife and I, and we're headed to our car. We are old souls, so our date night was uh, dusk. Dusk was happening. It wasn't even dark yet, and our date night was over, okay? That's how old souls we are. And so we're heading to the car, and I'm I'm looking at her, and of course she's, you know, googly eyes looking at me. (laughs) I'm exaggerating a little bit, but um, so we're talking, and we're heading to our car, and it's just past the four-way stop, and and at the four-way stop, I, I noticed that there was a truck stopped, and um, I, I hear some kind of yelling, and, and I'm looking at her, and I'm trying to see, okay, someone's yelling from this truck. This is a truck with big wheels. The windows were down. You could tell he just turned the, the loud music down, and this guy, he's shirtless with a backwards cap, and he's looking out the window, and he's yelling something. And I turn to my wife and I go, it almost sounds like he's yelling at us. And he keeps yelling and yelling. All of a sudden, as we're walking closer, he's yelling louder. I start to think I hear my name. Eddie, Eddie. And I turn to my wife and go, he's saying my name or unless there's another Eddie around here. And all of a sudden he goes, Eddie, it's Gavin, it's Gavin. And he's saying Gavin, and in my head, you know where someone says their name and you're like doing the Rolodex of names or you're trying to go, how do I know you or do I know you or are you just crazy? And so he's yelling and as we get closer, he looks like someone that I knew when we lived in Florida. It looked like a former student of mine that I I pastored when And I knew him when he was just a little middle schooler. And so 
turns out he, he, pulls, he pulls in and we get closer and he comes out and is that student from middle school from Florida. And I go, Gavin, what in the world are you doing here? And he was telling his story, how his family recently moved up to Pilot Mountain, how he just turned 18. And as I'm talking to him, you know, remember, he's shirtless, backwards cap. He's got like a diamond earring and a couple tattoos. And, and, he, and I go, well, Gavin, what are you doing in downtown Winston? Like, what are you doing down here? And he said the most 18-year-old thing I think I've ever heard in my entire life. I go, Gavin, what are you doing down here? He goes, I'm burning gas and looking for girls. <laughs> I'm burning gas and looking for girls. Okay, that is a true 18-year-old. You see, that moment, that encounter, that caught me off guard. And today, we're going to be reading a story about Jesus catching his disciples off guard. We're going to be looking at John chapter 21. If you have your Bible, simply turn there. And let me set it up this way. This is the last chapter in the Gospel of John. And in this chapter, we will see some encounters that Jesus has. Now, one chapter prior, in chapter 20, we see that Jesus, um, that Mary Magdalene visits the empty tomb. She visits the tomb and she goes, uh oh, Jesus' body is nowhere to be found. And she's um, afraid. And then we see, so that's the first encounter. Where, um, where we'll see uh, Mary encounter Jesus. And then we will see three other encounters. We'll see a total of four encounters where Jesus encounters people after he rose from the grave, after he conquered death, and now he's going around to his people. So Mary uh, comes to Jesus in chapter 20. We see uh, Mary has an encounter with Jesus and she talks to him and she is obviously caught off guard because uh, what is Jesus doing talking to her? Now remember in first century, in the first century time, a, a woman did not have a credible word. And the very first person that the savior of the world chooses to share that yes he's conquered the grave yes he is the risen messiah he is here he is alive is a woman that says a lot about who jesus is you see uh my i got a five-year-old and a three-year-old and my five-year-old right now is in kindergarten kindergarten learning a lot of new things that mommy and daddy did not teach him right he's coming home from school and i go where did you learn that? One of them is boys rule and girls drool, okay? <laughs> now, for you women in here, you can say girls rule because Jesus came to a woman first to show that he is the risen king and Messiah, all right? That's what you women have on us, okay? There you go. So Jesus comes to Mary Magdalene and shares with her that, yes, he is risen. And then there's three encounters with the disciples. The first one, the disciples are locked away in a room because of fear of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus appears to them. In that encounter, Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. In the second encounter, in chapter 20, we see... Uh, where Jesus, uh, he comes to his disciples again. This time he comes to them with Thomas. The first time that Jesus came to him, Thomas was not there. So when he comes, he makes sure Thomas is there. If you know anything about Bible, about the scriptures, you know that Thomas is really referred to as Doubting Thomas, which what a bummer of a nickname to be given. Doubting Eddie, Doubting Larry, Doubting so-and-so. Man, that would be a nickname I would not want to have, especially when it's, you know, so known in our culture for centuries now. 
But anywho, we see Thomas. He says, listen, I won't believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead unless I can see and touch Jesus' hands and side where his nails were from the cross. And so Jesus appears and lets Thomas see for himself. That was the second encounter. And then the third encounter to the disciples was the one we will be looking at today. And here's the big idea that we're going to be going. As we, as people, if we want to encounter God, if we want to encounter Jesus, we need to know that he changes everything. Friend, for you who, who, who do, doesn't know who Jesus Christ is, who, who you haven't made him your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, when you encounter Jesus, he changes everything everything he changes everything so this is the story we're going to be looking at we'll start in verse one it says this afterward jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of galilee it happened this way simon peter thomas nathaniel from gana uh, uh, cana and then galilee and the sons of zebedee and the two other disciples were together i'm going out to fish simon peter told them And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Imagine if you have spent all this time and effort in the night, losing sleep, going to fish, and you catch nothing. Maybe some of you have been in that spot where you put so much effort and energy into something And you get nothing from it. That's an exhausting place to be. But notice in this text, notice that that Peter, that they go back to their everyday routine, their everyday job, their everyday lifestyle of going fishing. That's what they were doing before they encounter uh, Jesus. And, and here they are. They're going back to their roots. They've they got to earn a living somehow. And so here they are. They are back to where they were. Let's go on. It says this in verse 4. It says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because the number of fish. Think about that. Jesus gives some advice to them on fishing. Jesus is a lot of things and apparently an expert fisherman as well. It goes on in verse 7. It says, then the disciples whom Jesus... The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and jumped into the water. Now just fathom this for the moment. You have this boat filled with all these disciples, all these men, and now Simon Peter. And if you remember... The story, yes, Mary Magdalene was the first person to realize that the tomb is empty, but the first person she grabbed was Peter. And so Peter is, of course, excited to see Jesus again. And and so he jumps in full-blown clothes on and everything into the water, and he's swimming to shore. Just imagine how difficult that probably was, swimming with all that clothes on. And so... I love his passion. I love seeing Peter's passion for Jesus. And it just made me think, am I that passionate about coming to Jesus as well? Are you that passionate? When was the last time that, that you, when was the last time that I, I dropped everything that I was doing and I focused and I fixated my eyes on Jesus? Or when did I carve out time when I heard someone say, hey, I'm hurting. Hey, I'm in a tough spot. Hey, I need prayer. And I stopped whatever I was doing and I spent time with them and I prayed with them. When did I do that as an intentional step? I'd want to encourage you to ask that same question. 
So it goes on in verse 8. It says this. It says, uh, The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net, the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning of coals where there was fish on it and some bread. Now notice this picture. That the Peter, yes, he's swimming towards Jesus with his full clothes on, and the other disciples were rolling back or rolling back to shore on the boat. But notice that Jesus has prepared like a barbecue for them, right? Now, to be clear, I know a barbecue when I see one, okay? Burning coals, some meat on the grill, a side dish of some bread. Trust me, it was a barbecue. And so Jesus says to them, he says, some of the fish, uh, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Now there's something, a small, small detail in this text that I want us to notice today. Let's look at this notion where Jesus tells his disciples to bring to him some of the fish that they had caught. You may naturally think, okay, well, Jesus is asking them to bring some of this fish because he needs it for his barbecue. But if you notice in verse 9 that Jesus already had fish on the grill. Jesus already had fish cooking. He didn't need their fish, but... He wanted to see the fruit of their labor, the effort that they put in of catching this fish. It wasn't, and even that wasn't even that accurate because Jesus earlier in the t story told them where to throw their net out on the right side of the boat, right? But Jesus wanted to see them smile as they pulled that fish off and that Jesus could see their great harvest. And there's something that to me reveals something about who God is in this text. You see, God does not need us to accomplish his mission in this world. God has chosen to work through us to accomplish his mission in this world. That God loves to see his children serve and to follow him. And we will see later in the text that as followers of Jesus, we are called to be people to feed his sheep. And we are called to be his hands and feet in this world. But he doesn't need us. He's God. He can do everything himself, but yet he invites us in. He wants to use us. He calls us into his story. You see, God doesn't need to use us, but he desires it. So I have a three-year-old daughter, and my daughter loves to clean up after herself. She loves to clean up the playroom. She loves to make her bed. And these are things that her mother and I taught her. Really, her mother, okay? Um, and so, it's just amazing. It's amazing after she plays with the toys and her brother plays, she wants to just clean everything back up. And, one, and yesterday, actually, uh, my son was uh, jumping on her bed and ruining her, her nicely, nicely made bed, right? And so she's like yelling at him, get off the bed. And, and then immediately he gets off and she starts tucking in the corners and making it all nice again. And you see that value of cleaning up after yourself, that was something that we instilled into our daughter, I'm fully capable, my wife is fully capable of picking up these toys, of making her bed, of doing all the things. We don't need her to do that, right? To be honest, these are toys that myself or one of the grandparents or someone near to us bought the toys. They're, they're ultimately our stuff, but yet it warms our heart to see our daughter have a value that we have of cleaning up after herself. And to a similar degree, our Heavenly Father loves 
He's fully capable of operating and leading the world however he chooses to do. But yet, he's chosen to work through his people. He's chosen to see people be his hands and feet in this world. And just like I love seeing my daughter clean up her bed and pick up her toys, it makes me smile. Our Heavenly Father loves to see when his people are on mission, serving and loving and being his feet, hands and feet in this world. And friends, for, for some of you who don't follow Jesus, let me just say this. There is nothing you can do to earn God's love. There is nothing you need to prove to him. He's God. He's, God. He, he's good to go. He doesn't need your love, but he desires it. He wants to be in a trusting relationship with you. And just as my daughter has instilled some of our values into her, God wants to instill some of his values into you. God wants to instill in us to be a people who love, who sacrifice, who fights for justice, who stands up for the marginalized and the impressed, who welcomes the stranger to, the, to be a part of the family of God, who labors out of love for the Lord. A preacher, uh, uh, John Piper, famously says this. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And when we encounter Jesus, friend, let me tell you, he changes everything. He will change your life. He will change your relationships. He will change your perspective on how to view the world. He changes everything. And when you realize that and you start having encounters with the living God and you spend time in his word and you pray regularly and you rest in the fact that you are a beloved child of God who is faithfully trying to follow him, friend, that is a powerful place to be. That's the place where God wants you to be. Let's read on in verse 12. It says, Jesus says to them, come and have breakfast. Now remember, the menu for, for breakfast is fish and bread, okay? I don't know what your breakfast looks like. Mine usually looks a little different than that. Though I guess you can have salmon and cream cheese and bagel as a, as a breakfast item. So I guess that could work. It says this, it says, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's go on. It says this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lamb. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Take care of my sheep. And then the third time, the third time in verse 17 it says, the third time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon, or Peter was hurt. Like, can you not hear Jesus? Like, do you not understand I've already answered this question. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. You see, Jesus here is pushing for clarity about Peter's love, his care for him. But if we step back, we will see an interesting connection with these three questions that Jesus asked. Asked. You see, earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells Peter that he will deny him three times, that Peter will deny Jesus. And of course, that ends up being true. So fast forward to this passage, we see these three questions of do you love me correspond with Peter's three denials that we see in John chapter 13. 
And only in the way that Jesus could, these questions almost show as a sign of forgiveness to Peter. Saying, hey, I know you messed up. But I want to just hear that you do love me. I forgive you. And the way he almost shows him forgiveness is he gives him a task, a job to do to feed his sheep. And if we remember at the beginning of the story that Peter was on a boat doing his everyday life, his everyday job of going fishing. But now Jesus is calling him back to the, to the work, to the kingdom fruitful work of caring for God's people. You see, Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd. And Jesus tasked us, his people, tasked Peter to help with the shepherding. And here's how uh, Jesus ends his words. He says this, he says, feed my sheep. In verse 18, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted but when you are old, you will, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Follow me. That idea, follow me, that Jesus calls Peter and the disciples to do. What is the best way to follow Jesus, how can we best know him? How can we best feed God's sheep? How can we care and love for the people around us? Believe it or not, believe it or not, I think it's kind of oddly simple. I know you probably came here today looking for a profound thought or something to, wow, I can really walk home with this knowledge of. Fortunately, you're going to get something oddly simple today. And here it is. Get into God's word. What's the best way to follow Jesus? Is to fall in love with the scriptures. Is to read his word, to read the Bible, to get to know what it says. If we want to know how to love like Jesus, you should probably know how he loves Right? If you want to be a person of reconciliation and redemption, you should probably know what does that look like. You know, I was talking to um, Pastor Mike a, a few weeks ago, and one of the things I was telling him, I was kind of just kind of spitting off on the top of my head, where do I think that the church at large will be in 20 or 30 or 40 years? And I told them, I said, one of the things I'm really nervous about is Bible illiteracy, is biblical illiteracy, is where our culture is going so far this way that they are abandoning this book. And I don't know about you, but man, as I, I even uh, interact with different people, it's amazing to me, not... I don't need people to know what Hebrew word says this or what Greek word is that or what, what, what the different tie-ins of different stories. I don't need necessarily to know that, but just even basic stories of who's Noah? Who's Moses? Who's the Apostle Paul? What is kind of the, the arc theme of the scriptures? What is God trying to communicate through his word? It makes me nervous. Because as the people of God, we need to know his word. And as the church, we need to be people who, who lay this down as the foundation of everything that we do. And here's the, here's the crazy thing. The stats show that if we actually get into God's word, he does literally change everything in our life. The, the Center of Biblical Engagement did a survey a little while ago asking people who read the Bible four or more times a week how their lives were impacted. 
how their lives were changed. So this survey shows people who read the Bible four more times a week. Here's how their lives were changed. Gossiping, the probability of gossiping happening in, in their life went down 28%. Neglecting family went down 26%. Overeating went down 20%. Mishandling money went down 20%. Feeling bitter went down 40%. Self-destructive thinking went down 32%. Feeling like you have to hide what you do or feel down 32%. Having difficulty forgiving, down 31%. Experiencing, experiencing loneliness, down 30%. Experiencing fear or anxiety, down 14%. Feeling spiritually stagnant, down 60%. Feeling like you can't please God, that probability went down 44%. When you encounter Jesus, he, he, he changes everything. He changes everything. Now there's some upside too, right? Giving uh, the probability, if you read your Bible four or more times a week, the probability of you giving financially to your home church goes up 416%. Imagine if we just, uh, uh, during our offering time, if we just said, hey, uh, thank you for those who, who gave today and read their Bibles four or more times a week, Right? Discipling others, right? We want to impact our world for Christ and we want to raise up people who know Jesus. Discipling others, when people read the scriptures four or more times a week, went up 231%. Sharing your faith with others, up 228 times a week. Now that's just four or more times. What if it was every day? Probably should be every day how much even more of a difference that would be. You see, if we want to be a people who feed Jesus' sheep, to care for those around us, who lead, who we need to lead from a spiritually strong place. We need to be tethered to the scriptures, to be tethered to God's word. And if we want to be his hands and feet in the world, we need to remember the starting place of carving out time with him. Lifeway Research did a similar study and here's what they found that reading the Bible is the number one predictor of spiritual maturity. You want to be spiritually mature? Get into his word. I think it's kind of obvious what today's next step is of what the challenge of what the call is for us today. The call is simply, like I said, it's oddly simple. It's to get into God's word. You know, one of the things I love about our church is how uh, much we intentionally try to help people get into God's word. There's a kiosk out in the lobby where, uh, go ahead and throw the photo up. There's a kiosk there. And there's two things in there that, that I'd want to encourage you to get. Um, the first one is we have these little um, brochures called Our Daily Bread. If you've never heard of it, it is simply a, a, a short little scripture and a little devotional. And it's simply just a time for you to get into God's word. It takes a couple minutes. We also have a little quarter sheet uh, about some uh, Bible studies that happen through the week, some of the Sunday school classes, some of the other opportunities for you to get into God's Word. That's not including all the, all the groups, and uh, men's ministry, women's ministry, small groups that happen all throughout the weeks. Those are all opportunities for you to get into God's Word. There are so many Bible apps that you can have to get into God's Word. Uh, there's one thing that we as a church, we provide to you as a gift to you to get into God's Word. It's called Right Now Media. Uh, go ahead and throw that up. Right Now Media is a platform where you can go and you can watch video content of sermons, of uh, small group studies, of leadership trainings, of different things like that. They have kids content on there. And it's all around helping you grow in your faith and to get into God's 
word. If you uh, want to uh, uh, join Right Now Media and be a part of that, you can simply email me um, and I will help you get into uh, Right Now Media. I would love to be able to help you with that. I, I think we have my, uh, I always get a little nervous if I put my email up there. But go ahead, you can email me. I, seriously, I just want people to be in God's word. That is so my heart. Please email me. I'd love to help you get connected with Right Now Media. And then, obviously, the most simple, maybe you have a hardcover Bible, right? Something you can smell, you can open up, you can accidentally spill your coffee on. But just to get into God's Word, I actually have a couple copies right up here that if you don't have a Bible today, I would love, and we as a church, we would be honored to give you one of these Bibles as a gift from our church to you so you can get into God's word. Church, when we encounter Jesus, he changes everything, amen? He changes everything. And I love how the book of John, the very last sentence in the book of John, how it ends. It says this in verse 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Think about that. That Jesus' life was so profound, so impactful that there wouldn't even be enough books in this world to tell all the stories. What if to a maybe a different degree, but if what if something like that was true for your life? On the day when you went to be with the Lord and and that funeral was set up for you and that time of uh, that time where there's an open mic and allow people to share something about your life and how you impacted them, what if that time was so profound that that people were lining up out the door, lining up out the door to talk about all the ways and all the times, all the times that you impacted them for Christ. Imagine, imagine if that line was so long that eventually the, the, the preacher or the funeral director had to come up and say, hey guys, if we keep going, we'll be here for days and days and days, right? But wouldn't that be amazing if that was true? That we lived such an impactful life, that we were so changed by God's word, that there were stories upon stories and testimonies of lives being changed because of your faithfulness to God. I don't know about you, but that's the life I want to live. Jesus invites us to his story, invites us into his story of being a people changed and marked by him. And so today, maybe in here, you, you, you've never really encountered Jesus or really met Jesus or, or tried to understand who he is today there's an opportunity for you to know him. If you wanna give your life to Jesus Christ and you wanna trust him with your whole life and you wanna be baptized and you wanna start following him today, you have that opportunity. I'd love to have you come forward or maybe meet me in the back. I'd love to pray with you. Maybe for some of us today, we just, we know we need to get into God's word. We know that's like the thing to do and yet we kinda of run the rat race. Today, I'm just here to say, fall in love with it. Fall in love with God's word that every day you hunger to be in his word. Do you hunger to be in God's word? If not, maybe you and God during this time of worship, maybe you just have a heart to heart conversation with him and say, God, would you put that desire in me today? So let's stand, and let's worship him. And, and at the end of service, maybe you're new. I'd love to meet you right in the back, but let's worship together now.